And it's 11 minutes past two. Welcome to A Healthy Chat with Sue and Megan. And welcoming into the studio, we have Yasmin Probst, our dietitian for A Healthy Bite. Welcome back, Yas. Mm. Hi, how are you? Very well. well. Thanks. How are you on this Monday afternoon? <sighs> Not too bad. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting Monday, that's for certain. We've had a very busy weekend. Mm. Yeah, I know. I feel, I'm a bit like that. I feel like I need another weekend. Yeah, did you know, over the last one? Let's just let's mm. just call one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I like that idea. Yeah. So, Yasmin, we're working our way through the vitamins, and we've done A, B1, B2, B3. And now we're up to our gap in the B vitamins. Mm. So there was a bit of a gap at Mm. B4. So we don't actually have a B4 anymore. Um, I mean, back when it was originally discovered, choline, what we call it now, is what was thought to be our vitamin B4. What's it called? Yes. Choline. Choline. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And it's something that's it's still important, obviously, to our bodies. Um, if we can synthesize it in really small amounts, but not enough that we can survive without having some from our dietary intakes. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's obvious it's important for fat synthesis and transportation and so forth. But it's a funny little one. It was discovered from boiling up pig bile. Oh, as you do. <laughs> yeah, it does something, you know, just in your spare time, boil up a bit of pig bile. Mm. Why not? Um, but then there were fluctuations in whether there was actually a state of deficiency. And that's really what stemmed from in terms of the science for working out whether it is a vitamin or not. Mm -hmm. So it was decided that there was no true form of deficiency, um, even though women actually need or seem to use it more efficiently than men do. So who determines in a worldwide sense what is and what isn't Mm. one of those sort of classifications? Yeah, so it's it's based on scientific consensus in the end, and each country does do that differently. I mean, in in Australia, we do have what's called an adequate intake level for Mm -hmm. choline, Um, So it's based on the scientific publications that are out there. And with choline, it's largely animal studies. So we have to be quite careful there Mm. about how we interpret the animal studies in relation to human intakes. Mm. So we can't go any further than adequate intake studies until we have more human studies, I guess. Mm. So we just don't refer to B4 usually? No, no, we don't refer to B4 anymore. Um, Mm. We move straight up to B5, which we'll talk about next Mm -hmm. time. Um, but it's just referred to as choline nowadays. Right. Interesting. Oh. The gap. Mm. Yeah. One of many. Yes. Yes, there were quite a few that were debunked along the way, and we can address those as we reach them. Mm. Um, mm. But, I mean, it's still an important component in our foods. We need to we eat it so we can find it in our fish and meat and eggs and so forth and beans. Um But it's not quite at the same level as all the other vitamins mm. that people right. are more familiar with. So it's yes. critical and, yeah, and therefore defined as a deficiency, as you said. Yeah, the deficiency yeah. component, definitely, mm, definitely. Mm, mm. Yeah. And so what's happening in the dietetic media? There's been a fair bit going on in the dietetic media. Um, a lot of items popping up. Um, I'm always monitoring the conversation, so mm. there have been quite a few popping up recently. Um, and there have been some that aren't really showing us or our Australian intakes in a particularly good light. Mm. Um, so there was one recently about what do we actually eat and how do we eat in Australia and surprise, surprise, our junk food levels are really, really high. Oh. So they're not decreasing. I mean, this has ha- had so much media attention, so much press in the last, oh, I don't know, how many years. Well, the big sugar have been talking about yes. it for a long time. Mm. Um, and so that's really not impacting. Or the, are these results from earlier surveys? Yes, so these results that have come through are from the latest Australian Health Survey. Oh, yeah, right. And Ooh. no, the figures aren't looking any more positive. Mm. Um, our, our intakes are still really high. So our adults, largely the discretionary foods, as we call them these days, um, but it's just basically junk food. It's coming from... <laughs> discretionary food. Discretionary <laughs> foods, okay. yes. yes. Yep. Um, it's coming from alcohol. So it's oh, not surprising. That's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Whereas with the kids, it's coming from those biscuits and cakes and yeah. the really convenient products um, that we see a lot of in the shops as mm. well. I'm really surprised we're not seeing a, a reduction in that, actually. Because we all know and we should know. And well, we do. And I, I just think it's so widely advertised and spoken about. Mm. You know, as a mum of, of young kids, I just think it's everywhere in the media, you know, the, the awareness of the amount of sugar that our children are eating. But I think it's a saying and the doing, like everything well, in life, true. that, we, you know, That's we should true. be exercising more, we should right. be doing this, 
True. Yeah. Mm. And I think that it's, it's one of those things that once kids get a taste for it or get it, get it under their skin, so to speak, it's mm. really hard to pull back. Yeah. yeah. It's also a tricky one in terms of the food categorization side of things because mm. we're constantly grouping foods as dietitians. Um, but if we think about those discretionary foods, it equates to about 600 kilojoules, which doesn't mean much to the average person, but it's only about six hot chips. Six so that, hot that's chips. one serve of wow. discretionary food. So we can easily get through, you know, quite, quite a few a lot, serves yeah. there if we have a small hot chips mm. in front of us. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. So they can large see hot chips. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, uh, and would you like something else with that? Mm. Double up on that. Right. Yeah. But I did notice over the top. Yeah. Right through the roof. In mm. that, it's, this is a report put out by the Australian Institute of Health mm. and Welfare, which, as we know, is one of our favourite mm. referrals. Um, and there's a, a, a graph and uh, or a, a, a table and it's showing the excess consumption of these foods it starts from two to three year olds Mm -hmm. and just proceeds to get worse so that a two to three year old has well little boys eat 3.2 serves and the recommendation is only maximum of three and it just gets worse and worse with men or teenage boys 14 to 18 having 7.5 serves and then it goes up to seven, and it doesn't get much better. So by the time they get to 71 and over, they're still eating 5.3 serves. Women and girls are slightly less, but not that much less. Mm. Yeah, it's, they're quite scary numbers, these, yeah. that are coming through. Mm. And, I mean, it's our population, almost two in three people are overweight. Yeah. Mm. And then if we do look at that older category that you were just referring to there, um, Sue, so the 51 to 50, oh, 70 year olds are almost 80% overweight. That's, mm. that's a really scary statistic. Yeah. And we don't want to keep going in that direction. We don't mm. want those numbers to keep increasing. Mm. Mm. So we need to definitely start listening to some of these health promotion messages and change the way we approach mm. eating again. Yeah, it's like having to have a whole re- restart, mm. a cleanse out. But I mean, how? I mean, it's so inculcated into culture now that you know grabbing something going just i was going to say i think it's got a lot to do with life with lifestyle yeah and being busy because everyone is always busy and so the convenience of grabbing a lot of this food yes discretionary food you know the the muesli bars the pre-packaged processed food Mm. that you you know often find in children's lunch boxes Mm. i think that has a really big big bearing on this it definitely mm. does, yeah. Mm. And it's also not just the convenience, it's almost the lack of understanding of some of those products. That's so right, yeah. They can be sold with a healthy spin to them mm. and so the average person will think, wow, okay, I'll buy some of this and yep. pop it in the kid's lunchbox and it must be good for them. Yeah. Mm. Um, but unfortunately there are some hidden things mm. in there that may not be as good for us as we might have thought. Mm. Exactly. Well, I mm. hope that this, this paper, which this um, article in the conversation just came out on Friday, I hope it gets a lot of pick-up and gets slapped all over the media. Yeah. Because the more we can talk about it, mm. you know, whilst we say we do know and um, we should do, we clearly don't. And so I guess just every awareness that we can make mm. and I suppose helping and supporting our kids to making those healthier, healthier choices. Mm. Um, well, it, just, it just, you know, has a cumulative effect mm. and then leads to all our health health Mm. problems later in life, doesn't it? Indeed, diabetes, cardiovascular Mm. disease, on and on it goes. Mm. And they're all just, it's like a catch-22 that we're layering up. And probably, sadly, for the kids of Mm. today, the sort of the two to five-year-olds, compared to when, well, certainly me, Mm. (laughs) older generation than both of you, (laughs) um, when I was, I wasn't probably exposed to as much junk food at an earlier age. Obviously, I've caught up with myself. But, you know, now kids... It's so much more uh, prevalent. They're just getting exposed earlier and well, earlier. There's so much more there, isn't there? It's so yeah. much more available. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I remember for us, we lived out of town and going to town once a week to, for, to buy 20 cents worth of lollies at the corner store was the biggest mm. treat. And, you know, you got a, a bag full of lollies, you but that was only a, once a week. You would have had a lot of lollies yeah. for 20 cents then too. Yeah, so. I ate them all at once. <laughs> <laughs> I remember buying cobbers for two cents yeah. at the swimming pool. Yeah. Mm. But now, like, it's much more prevalent. There's chips. Mm. There's, we didn't have soft drinks. No, it doesn't soft, seem to exist. Soft, soft drinks are huge thing. Yeah. That we didn't, you know, we had it. I mean, it was certainly available, but not something that... No. Yeah, it's now one of our highest sources of added sugar yeah. intake in the population. Mm. So... You know, what do we need to do differently? And there's definitely something that needs to be done differently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, But the role modelling with the children, I Mm. think, is a really good starting point. Mm. Um, 
But I guess moving on from that to the other extreme of eating, there's also another one about organic eating. So the complete opposite Mm. end of Mm -hmm. of of food intake. Yes, exactly. Um, But it's similarly related to those chronic diseases. So this particular piece that came through in the same um, edition of the conversation was really about organic eating and the relationship with cancer intake. Um, Because a lot of people seem to think that going Mm. for organic produce is something that can help to prevent or even to cure, um, which is a bit of misinformation in particular. Mm. But organic produce is really just a different form of what already exists out there. So these are products that are produced without those synthetic chemicals um, and it varies from country to country. So in Australia, um, that's our general definition. We don't have to be certified um, Mm. There is a certification program, but it's not mandatory, similar with the United States. Is that States. right? I didn't realise that. So it's not a mandatory program? No, like, so definitely you, not. You can put an organic sticker on your whatever, fruit, but you, you haven't actually had the process, gone through the certification process? That's, to my understanding, that is how it works. It's being tightened up, but at the moment, um, the Food Standards Code does not require you to be certified. I wow. mean, some, some manufacturers, the well-known ones presumably are, mm. But it doesn't um, prevent, I suppose, mm. other people Jumping claiming band, claiming like, organic mm. status. That's right, yeah. Mm. Definitely. Well, and because it is more expensive too, isn't mm. it? It definitely is. And that's really what it's shown in this mm. particular piece, that there's a link with a, the wealth of a person, how much income they have, um, and also you know, the, their choice of then the organic products as a result of having that disposable income at hand. Mm. Um, so there are a lot of studies now showing that there are clear links between organic food purchases and consumption and those higher levels of income and education as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And this particular piece where it's linking it to cancer was based on a study of people who can purchase behaviours from from France in particular, Mm -hmm. Um, which, again, different regulations over there. Um, But I guess the main thing to keep in mind for people who are reading pieces like this is it's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario. So... Those who eat organic produce and develop cancer or the other way around don't develop cancer, it, you can't necessarily say that there's a causal effect no. there because there are so many other factors coming into play, you know, genetics being one of them. Yes, yeah, a big absolutely. one that we, yeah, we're only absolutely. scratching the surface mm. of. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm. So we need to be very, very careful how we read some of these papers um, mm. where it's saying, oh, you know, organic consu- egg, Organic produce consumption will prevent cancer, prevent cancer yes. or yes. cure cancer. Who knows in the yes. future? Mm. Um, we need to be very careful and read into the background studies, um, which aren't always easy reading either. Mm. Mm. Yes, that is a very topical because uh, it's Health Literacy Month at the moment, uh, along with every other month. But we had discussed media literacy recently, mm. Megan, yes, and yes. this just plays perfectly into that yes. because the headlines and the content don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. It's a bit like the organic certification. You know, they can just pull out the headline with the key words and have organic cancer or organic, you know, link, um, prevents cancer, which is a real interpretation. Mm. And when you read into it, it's either like this study here, which Rosemary Stanton, I think, is the, is the author, has author of this piece commenting on the study, had said that this is the first study of its kind. And that's, that in and of itself is important because there needs to be many, many more studies that layer onto that re- research, which, yes, yeah, as the research, I'm sure you um, can explain more. But... Um, Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, just having one of these first studies does definitely not create a body of evidence. And it's the body of evidence that we really look for when we're trying to make claims in an area. But for cancer in particular, the strongest evidence is just what we already know. So eating higher amounts of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. So those food products that we generally promote for healthy eating through our Guide to Healthy Eating and Dietary Guidelines Mm. are the ones that are going to have, from what the science shows, the most benefit. Mm. Um, Whereas organic at this stage, it's still too early to be able to say. Mm. I mean, we should be just disposing of some of the discretionary and just eating any kind of fruit and veg. I think that might be a very good idea. Let alone inorganic or organic. Yeah, Mm. so 600 kilojoules of fruit and veg rather than 600 kilojoules of Mm. hot chips. Mm. (laughs) Making that your easy go-to option Mm. rather than the... So just coming back to those recommendations, because I think that this paper also showed, the study showed that they were so way off, way, way off eating the recommended five serves of uh, veggie and or a bit closer on the two serves of, um, of um, fruit. But, mm. you know, we have just got so much 
further to go. But as we've discussed, as, as you've highlighted in other um, uh, other shows, it's actually not that hard to do if you make that first step. Uh, definitely, definitely. It's it's a case of making that active commitment to wanting to increase your fruit and veg intake as well. And, you know, grabbing the odd piece of fruit or rather than even grabbing a vegetable to mm. snack on mm. takes a moment of your time. It doesn't require any preparation, a bit of a wash and you're done. And you can snack on a cucumber or you can snack on your capsicum or chop up a tomato and, you know, munch on that. It's it's so simple and, mm. you know, kids need to be aware that that's the case and they don't always need to get something out of a packet mm. to be able to have something that tastes good in front of them. Mm. And I think that the piece of, that you wrote for the conversation about the rainbow colours, that sort of stuck with me. And, and just by even thinking, just put a rainbow on the plate, mm. that is encouraging you to find another vegetable that you can put on. Mm. Just even just trying to increase the colour palette not even thinking, oh, what's my fourth vegetable or what's my fifth vegetable, but just thinking, oh, what's my fifth colour? Yeah. And that will naturally lead you there in some ways. Exactly, exactly. Because if you look at the plate and you're thinking, oh, it's a bit too much white and brown happening here, I think you probably need to add a few more vegetables to your plate. Mm. Um, and that's a good thing for kids to learn early on because they really will take that into later life and it will be ingrained in their thinking when they start preparing meals mm. and hopefully cooking them in the kitchen as opposed to purchasing them too many mm. times. Mm. 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 Very true. And, and just coming back to the organic, you know, we talk about planting your own. Planting your own in your garden will be organic unless you get out with the, you know, the, I suppose the Roundup and the insecticides. But there's lots of natural ways, and many people don't do that anyway, in their own backyard. Um, and so planting your own, you can be organic just by yourself you can mm. you can and combination planting so com- sorry companion planting mm. so the right fruits and vegetables with one another can actually help to starve off those bugs that might like to attack our cabbage mm. or whatnot mm. um and we don't need to add any extra fertilizer or any extra pesticides to our our produce and we can have it right there at our back door mm. Mm. It all Very seems straight. so simple, doesn't it? Mm. We and just have to do it. It's just a matter of actioning it. That's right. Mm. It is. Finding yeah. that time to have a go. Mm. Mm. But I think that once you get started, it does become like many things that people do in life. Once Whatever it is you're starting to do, it seems to be an effort. But when you get into a pattern of it, it does seem to roll along. I must say, you know, chopping up vegetables now and thinking about the things that we talk about here, it does make – it's more interesting when as you're chopping and thinking and – thinking about the things that you've been talking about so i think um with a little effort i think we can all make a big improvement Mm. to our own lives definitely definitely Mm. can Mm. yeah now what will we talk about next fortnight so next fortnight we will have another b vitamin to talk about so b5 pantothenic acid oh yes that's a bit of a mouthful that one one. (laughs) exactly practice that one i think we'll just pantothenic acid right there you go (laughs) so we have another true vitamin next time Mm -hmm. um and i think we'll also start touching on some of these issues around research practice and how we actually interpret our research so a little bit of awareness of how things can be spun out of proportion and what does it actually all mean? Mm. Yeah, I think that's so important, mm. particularly with the promotion of supplements of, of vitamins that we're talking about as well. So having a little understanding of that, I think, would be go a long way. Mm. Yeah. Now, for your song today, you've requested Conrad Sewell, Healing yes. Hands, which would have been perfect. However. However, <laughs> comma, <laughs> my technical support... Uh, my 15-year-old technical support. She's has, usually very reliable. She's so. usually very <laughs> reliable. So as an alternative, we'll have an Ed Sheeran song, perfect. and it is perfect. perfect. Oh, that sounds perfect. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. So, perfect. Perfect. Um, serves the vegetables. Perfect diet. And, um, perfect we song. Can, perfect song. So thanks very much, Yaz, and we look forward Thank to seeing you. you.